Okay, hello everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Doug Hoyt, and um, yeah, yeah, I want to talk today blocking operations, exceptions, and logging in asynchronous servers. Um, so, sort of the motivation behind this is uh, a year or two ago, I needed to build um, a server that handled authorization and authentication uh, tasks, and uh, we ha we had this you know horrible, crufty Java Python conglomeration that did it, and everyone hated working with it. So I decided to replace it with a you know really simple event-based design, um, and yeah, as you can see, we you know settled on uh, Plaque, Twiggy, and any event underneath that. Uh, and yeah, this uh, talk is just about a few modules that I've uh, written for that and a few other things. Um, and yeah, so uh, first module is any event task. Um, essentially, it's a, a worker pool implementation so that your um, asynchronous program can p p perform blocking operations, right? And here's you know, some examples of blocking operations we needed to do in this particular server. We needed database access, um, which is you know, a problem because DBI isn't necessarily, um, it doesn't have an asynchronous interface. Uh, we also needed to do bcrypt, which you know, uses CPU, and therefore you can't do an event really way without blocking things. Uh, and also a whole bunch of other random, random interfaces that weren't, didn't have uh, asynchronous interfaces. Uh, the second module is callback frame. And, um, yeah, really, uh, error handling was a really sore point in the uh, old system, so really we wanted to make it a lot more effective in the new one. Uh, and the third module is uh, log defer. Um, so it, yeah, that's, it's just um, uh, sort of a module that helps with uh, logging. It makes logging a lot more convenient and asynchronous and also other servers that I think uh, you might find interesting. Uh, so first module I just want to cover is any event task. Uh, essentially, it's split into two components. You have a server component and a client component. Um, the only thing the server does is just sit there and fork off new uh, processes when, it's, when they're needed by the client. Um, and the client and server are completely separate, right? So uh, that way you can actually have POSIX thread in either one of them and do forking, right? Whereas you should never, uh, you know, if, uh, if you have threads created, you should never fork after that. So they're completely separate. So the server can fork and then create threads if it wants. Uh, each client keeps a pool of these workers around and, you know, it, it farms out tasks to them basically. Uh, and the client, uh, how it works is, I'll show you in the next slide, it acquires these checkout objects, and essentially they're like permanent locks where you've got a worker and you've got essentially per, uh, exclusive access to that worker for a while. Uh, and yeah, bit, all requests, checkout, acquiring, and everything is queued and timeouts, so you can start the server client in either order and uh, they can drop and re come back and so on. Um, here's like the really simple use case of how, of how, to, uh, how to use it. Um, one of the ways to use it. So yeah, two completely separate processes. You have a server and you have a client, right? Server starts up, listens on, for example, a Unix socket, uh, could be uh, internet socket to whatever, uh, and then you provide an interface. In this case, I just have a hash of methods, or like a hash of subs there, but uh, there's a few other ways you can like forward to objects and so on. Uh, and then in another process, you have the client. And the client really just is like a non-blocking interface that connects to these, uh, to the uh, server and you know, acquires these forked off worker processes. Uh, and at that point, you have, yeah, uh, you do all of your async processing stuff in the client. So here's how you use the client. Um, you acquire these checkout objects from the client, and then uh, you can call methods on the checkout. So in this case, you know, I'm just doing something really simple. I'm just adding 5 and 10, and then the final argument is a, a callback. And that callback is uh, called in the client when you get the result back from the server. So in this case, it's really just, you know, send over 5 and 10 over to the checkout, checked out client, or sorry, worker. Worker does the operation and then sends the result on back. Uh, the serialization right now is JSON, but I've got a branch that uses uh, serial now too, that'll probably, uh, this seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, and the other critical thing is that after the checkout goes out of scope in the client, the worker is returned back to the worker pool uh, of the client. Yeah, so here, here's how you do you know, two nested operations basically in the simplest way, right? So in this case, I'm adding three and four, and then when that message gets sent over to the server, server does the operation, sends the result on back to the client, and then uh, the callback is called. Uh, and at that point, uh, the, uh, I'm doing another thing inside the callback, using that che same checkout again, so that always goes rows to the same process, basically just multiplying those two numbers together, right? Result times result, so seven times seven, right? Problem with that is that you, uh, now you have two round trips to the server, right? You've done two RPC calls back to back sequentially, right? So another feature that uh, is supported um, in uh, the RPC pipeline branch of any event task. I haven't pushed it out quite yet. I need to write a few more tests. But what's supported is pipelining, right? 
uh, it, it's called promise pipelining. It's like uh, also using like the E language and so on. Um, and uh, I find it, it's got a lot of uh, benefits that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, yeah, the promises module on CPAN uh, talks about promise, uh, promise pipelining, but it's a different kind of pipelining. This is like as implemented in uh, E language. Um, so yeah, as you can see here, uh, you do the add, but instead of passing a sub as the final argument, you actually acquire uh, a promise, which is stored in a dollar X, right? And that promise can actually be uh, passed uh, into subsequent uh, method calls, right? So here, essentially what you've done is you've, you're sending a message that says over the server, add these two numbers together with the add method, and then take both those things, multiply them together with the multiply method, and then return the result. So that's got a few advantages. Um, number one, you've uh, re eliminated one round trip. You've, so you've only done one. Uh, you've you know, reduced the latency of your RPC operations. And uh, number two, it it's, you know, makes it so you don't have to like, clutter your API with crazy useless methods like add and square in this case, right? You can just have a very simple lockdown API that, uh, uh, you know, without sacrificing any latency. And it, it's some, uh, in some respects, feels like you're programming uh, synchronous code too. So, uh, here's another thing that I'm uh, working on. Is uh, it's, it's basically related to that, but not, not only can you pass promises in as arguments to other methods, but you can do all kinds of things with them, right? You're like for example, you can call methods on themselves. You can dereference them, and I've got like some crazy Perl overload magic that kind of like just makes it work. Um, and yeah, it's uh, you can do like DBI pretty well. Basically, yeah, every promise you do an operation, it like globs on, becomes a larger promise and promise and promise, and then you pass that whole thing over the network in one latency. Thank you, yeah, composability for sure. Um, <clears throat> second module is callback frame. Um, sort of the motivation for this is that uh, um, I wanted to uh, associate the error handlers and uh, uh, various other dynamic state with the callbacks themselves. So that when the callbacks are re uh, invoked, you can bring them back into existence, right? Um, I have local uh, in quotes there because actually uh, Perl's local actually creates temporally scope bindings, not local. <laughs> But uh, anyway, <laughs> fixed in six, good to hear. <laughs> but yeah, so basically you create these callback frames and when they're uh, invoked, the dynamic state is uh, reinstated. And really uh, the way I think about it is it's kind of, um, it, you know, it allows you to do uh, exception sort of code instead of return code. I'll show an example in a second. But one thing I really like, it, I actually really like um, callback style, right? A lot of people want to like abstract it away. Um, I really like it. And, Callback frame is kind of an unobtrusive sort of way of doing um, callback style. So here's like a, you know the uh, like a classic example of why uh, how exceptions are complicated in uh, uh, in an event handling program, right? Or an asynchronous program. So in this case, as you can see, like uh, I'm creating just a timer that's going to trigger in 100 milliseconds, uh, and then it's going to call this callback, right? And the callback's going to throw an error, right? That eval is obviously intending to ca catch that error and handle it in some fashion, right? However, that won't work because a timer all it does is install something in event loop and immediately return without failing, right? Um, so that you know that handler won't get called. We'll enter the event loop, and then at some point in the future, 100 milliseconds from now, exception will get thrown. Boom! It's thrown in the event loop. There's no way to tie it back to the error handler that you wanted to actually call, right? Here's how you'd uh, handle that with callback frame, right? So um, basically, you have these two. Uh, you have a few new. Um, functions that you can call, uh, use, frame try and frame catch. They're kind of like, uh, you know, try tiny uh, sort of like operations. And then also uh, you have this uh, function called fub, right? It's kind of, yeah, it basically it's the, the intent is that you can take like a normal callback based program and just change your subs into fubs, right? And then when, <laughs> it looks a little weird now, but it's, it kind of makes sense, you'll see. Uh, so in this case, yeah, what happens is frame try creates this uh, new callback frame uh, and then uh, any uh, new frames, for example, ones created with fub, are tied to that uh, uh, frame, right? So in this case, the frame has a catch handler installed, but you can also instand, uh, have like local, uh, like um, dynamic variable bindings and so on, right? Uh, and in this case, when the exception is thrown, the frame catch handler will run as expected, right? So if you know, typically you'd have like that, you know, it would be a closure that binds to uh, that's got like the connection data structure in it. So you could send a message to the client and log nice things like client X did this error, whatever. Um, and yeah, so sort of the nice thing is that you can pretty much take any sort of uh, callback based um, API and you can uh, more or less just uh, not change your code um, and get these sort of benefits, right? So in this case, I'm using any event HTTP, which gives you these sort of quote unquote in band signaling errors. 
um, where it will actually call your callback when there's an error, but set some sort of state or whatever, right? Uh, in this case, it's you know the status is something other than 200, right? But it's like you know that could be DNS failure, or whatever, right? The main point is I don't want to handle it in my callback. I want, you know I might have many callbacks nested, doing all kinds of other things. I want to handle it in one place, right? That's where it, I just you know if I create everything with fubs, um, and yeah, if you have like nested fubs, then the frame gets tracked, and obviously it's you know works like a stack. You have multiple frames, so you can like try one operation, retry it. If there's exceptions, all these sort of things, right? Um, so yeah, in this case, you can tie it back and handle it where you actually want to handle it. So that's that, that's callback frame. Um, final module I want to talk about is log defer. Um, personally, yeah, I think like a lot of like, I mean, how, how many people, have you, how many of you people have written uh, log parsers, right? Like everyone's done that, right? Written like some regex to parse out whatever, and you know, uh, I think personally a lot of log processing is done too early, right? And if we kind of like defer the processing to later. There's a lot of benefits. So log defer does two types of deferring, right? The first type is that um, uh, if you have some sort of like transaction, quote unquote, like a HTTP request or cron job or whatever, um, all the messages that are um, uh, logged in that transaction should be stored like atomically together and not like intermingled, right? So you should be able to look at all the messages that happen in that one transaction, right? And an async app, that's really important because you know there's like not like the conventional process ID or thread ID you can look at. Um, and the the second way that log defer defers messages is uh, delays the defers the rendering, right? So um, it, it records them in these uh, structured uh, in this sort of structured format, so that um, you can render it however you want later, right? So if you want to, uh, so I'll, yeah, just go to here. So yeah, so so here's here's an example of how. Um, Log for implement structured logging. There's obviously a whole bunch of other ways. I just want to mainly get the idea into it, uh, get the idea out here, right? So in this case, I've got uh, it, what log defer does is it writes out you know minified message per line JSON, um, and as you can see, that big blob at the top is what it logs, right? So it's impossible to read. No one's ever going to read it, right? However, a completely separate distro called log defer viz um, uh, is one way you can visualize them, right? Uh, and yeah, so here's what happens if you just like run that on the uh, the log file, right? It gives you like a nice sort of human readable message kind of thing, and you got colors and timers are also recorded and all this kind of clip there, but ignore that. Um, and you know they're shown in like a nice way. Uh, and one of the critical things is that it's customizable too, right? You don't like log to viz, bang, you know we're working on like web services that will show you the logs and stuff too. The critical thing is that they're structured, so you don't have, never have to write parsers again. You just write these reusable display sort of interfaces with structured logging. So here's some like just examples of things you can do with log defer viz. Um, so let's say you just you're not interested in warnings, you can just filter them out, no warns. Uh, it's got like a tail dash fe kind of mode. Um, also it just does what I mean with compressed files, so you you know it figures out. Um, other no, another thing is that yeah, often timestamps are really confusing log files, right? Like um, you got an office on the other side of the world, they're like looking at it, it's like, what's this EST junk I want? Singapore time, whatever. Uh, you can change the time zone easily and it just looks, looks nice, right? And also by default it's local time too. Um, yeah, also yeah, you can like sort and merge them really easily by like uh, various cr uh, criteria, in this case time. If you have a bunch of servers, you can merge them together and look at it actually sequentially. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, yeah, the you know filtering and processing and running queries and so on, right? So there's these two arguments, uh, grep and map, that are you know pretty similar to uh, Perl's grep and map. Um, and the way it works is that after decoding each one of these messages, it stores them in dollar underscore, uh, and then evaluates this expression in either your grep or map. So in this case, uh, uh, the the way that log defer uh, the stores the like duration of the request stores it in the end um, uh, field of the message. So really, if you want to like filter out all messages that took longer than half a second, that's an easy way to grep for it, right? And it's you know completely reliable, no false positives, um, and so on. Uh, and you, you notice I didn't have to write a parser there at all, right? I just wrote the display uh, expression. Um, however, you know, decoding JSON is uh, often uh, really slow. So one other sort of like design feature of the log defer uh, structured format is that you can pre-grab it, right? So you can a anywhere that string appears in there, uh, you can output it, right? Although in this case, obviously, you have to keep track of false positives and so on, right? But it's just like you know, often necessary sort of thing. Um, also, you know, there's other ways you can store uh, structured form uh, logs too. Right? It doesn't have to be JSON. There's all kinds of other serialization formats you might choose that are more efficient. Um, 
and then yeah, here's just like a final example of like you know just you know Unix stuff you can do like typical Unix co -op pipeline components and so on. Like in this case, I'm uh, mapping each one of these messages and just extracting like a username that was recorded, and then I can you know do the standard Unix tallying sort of get a nice report and that kind of thing. And that's basically all I have to talk about. All the stuff's on CPAN if you want to check it out. Um, we've been using it for quite a while. Uh, I you know, have to write a few more tests before the RPC pipelining stuff is uh, good to go, in my opinion. But I think it's going to be pretty cool when it does. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for listening to me. I'll take any questions. Uh, sure. Did you say you were using threads in addition to forking? Um, it's uh, usually not, but if you uh, it, it, sometimes um, the client, like an asynchronous client, wants to spawn threads in the background to do things like AIO kind of stuff. Uh, so the main problem is like if the client itself did the forking, then that would be you know very bad because you're forking a threaded application, right? However, the the separation of server and client is nice because the server is the only one that has to do the forking. The client never needs to do a forking, so it can use threads. Sorry, I should be more clear. Good question. Uh, in, yeah, it, it, that's a that's a valid concern for sure. Luckily, there's uh, sorting features, <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. It's um, you have to worry about that anyway, right? Like if you have two two processes or whatever uh, logging, um, it's kind of non-determinist which one's going to be first, right? So that's why you have timestamps so you can sort on and so on. So. I guess this is more of a trivial question, but when it comes to outputting your logs. You have to understand what kind of output you say JSON or any other kind of format. Do you have to encode it before you send it to it, or is it something that takes care of by the program that logged in? Uh, good question. Yeah, I kind of glossed over the log defer interface. Um, essentially, what it all, all it is is like a callback, right? The the funny thing is that log defer actually doesn't do any logging itself. It just gives you a callback, and then typically you would JSON encode that and write it to a file. Um, but yeah, if, you, if, if uh, I had uh, uh, cut a little bit out just for the brevity, but yeah, if you check out the log defer uh, pod, then it, it describes the interface there. Um, and yeah, you could do any uh, format, other format you want, if, if you don't like JSON or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks a lot.